Well, uh, thank you. Uh, totally different, uh, but often related to everything that we talk about in ophthalmology. Uh, so thank you for asking me to come and share with you uh, something that uh, doesn't have p-values and stuff like that. So really it's talking about sustainability. By definition, sustainability is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, what I talk about is a number of things, uh, not necessarily in this order, but perhaps uh, anything to do with sustainability has to start with climate change. So what does climate change really mean? It means unusual weather patterns, whether it's rain, whether it's temperature or extreme weather events. And many of these things are related to this greenhouse effect where the earth radiates the sun's heat and is trapped by greenhouse gases and warms the earth. So very simplistic sort of uh, explanation. I don't think that it's all of it, but what it's done is over the past 2,000 years has caused the temperature of the earth to definitely increase uh, alarmingly, not in the usual predictable pattern, but uh, certainly something more than that. And if you look at this map of Australia, you see that the temperatures are rising and the rain patterns are decreasing. So we are confronted with bushfires, we are confronted with drought and also floods at the same time. No country is immune not even India, where you've had a heat wave where the temperatures have gone up to beyond 50 degrees centigrade. And in fact, if this continues, you'll have unusual patterns of rain, you'll have unusual uh, water level rises in including Mumbai uh, and other coastal cities, and also a large impact on food production, so much so that it's estimated that up to 63 million people may not be able to meet their caloric demands for what is required to live. The children are going to be even more severely affected because the life of every child born today will be affected by climate change. And unless we do something, this is going to be uh, an impact on the next generation. So whether it's, uh, it's heat, whether it's increased dryness, whether it's increased uh, pollution, whichever way you look at climate change, it's going to impact health but it's also going to impact the eyes. There's going to be more uh, trachoma, more vitamin A deficiency, more allergies, uh, cataracts, name it. And I think that's going to increase the dependence on health systems. It's going to change our lifestyle. And of course, it's going to affect uh, mortality and you know eyes and vision and morbidity. So it's going to have a long-term effect. So wherever we start on climate change, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, pollution or plastics or whatever, it's going to have an impact on public health, on our well-being, and also on the social quality of our society. So it's all very good making statements like this, but the thing is, what should we be aiming for? Now, the different models, uh, uh, the SSP models, and I think we really need to be going at a sort of middle of the road as discussed in 2021 in Glasgow. Uh, so at least that gives us an aim, okay, what are we aiming for? As healthcare professionals, and uh, this is from a, uh, a, a paper by David Chang, whom, who's very well known in the cataract world, healthcare is responsible for almost 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. And we know that ophthalmology is a very high volume, uh, you know, surgical speciality. Amongst cataract surgeons, and I think also amongst people who, who do a lot of intravitreal injections, there's a feeling that we are, you know, so bound down by regulation, so bound down by the industry, we're so bound down by so many things that we perhaps are producing too much, too much waste. And in fact, if you look at it, uh, the published data from India, from Arvind, the eye care system, the post-operative endophthalmitis rate is less than the post-operative endophthalmitis surgically, in the United States. So something is not right the way we are going, and I think we need to, we need to address that. Healthcare, as you know, is a serious emitter of carbon, and we really need to look at how ophthalmology can reduce uh, our carbon emission without compromising patient care. Now, this is an example or a map of uh, 
a part of New Zealand, and the little red area at the bottom is Wellington, the capital. So in New Zealand, we have uh, the same problems of distance. Uh, people live far away from the center, and there are older people living in retirement homes and find it difficult to move. Uh, there are country hospitals, there are rural hospitals, but for injection, all of them travel down past hospital facilities, past clinics, all the way down to Wellington to go and get their injections. So, I mean, you'd say, well, why don't you put clinics uh, in on the way or bring people to rural clinics? So, obviously, we need to address this issue of manpower uh, in countries to reduce the carbon emission and carbon footprint. What about the other culprit, cataract? Now, it's possible to look at the carbon footprint of cataract surgery. It's, you can calculate that. If you look at these figures here, these are the figures from the National Health Service in the UK, and you can see the carbon footprint of a cataract surgery as compared to this little six kilogram of the, Ar uh, the Arvind systems calculation. And if you look at New Zealand, it's a little bit, little bit less. So what does this mean in real life? A 152 kilogram carbon equivalent is how much one person who lives for 5.9 days produces. It also amounts to the same amount of carbon that is produced by burning 67 liters of petrol. So you can imagine that you think cataract surgery is, is uh, you know, uh, benign. You think it's innocuous, but actually it's not. It is. It has a. It has a great impact on on climate change and also, so it doesn't matter whether you use renewable energy, that's why New Zealand is a little bit lower in the carbon production, but really we've got to look at other parts of the journey for cataract, and one of them is procurement. Now, we have consumables that are double packed, triple packed, uh, for whatever reason, but we must think of addressing this along with industry to reduce the consumption and to reuse and recycle. Thankfully, the most important uh, fact is that the commonest form or commonest mechanism of removing a cataract is thankfully not fake emulsification. If you take the global picture, it is small incision cataract surgery in whatever form you use it. Because not only is it cheaper, it's carbon footprint because less uh, reusables, uh, uh, less disposables, more reusables, and, and so on it's much, 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 much less, and the results are getting even better and better. And to this, I, this end, I'd like to, uh, like to point out the uh, International Society for M6 in India, which is an Indian initiative, the job they're doing, and also Help Me See, which have got a surgical simulator for, M for M6, and I think that that's really going to be uh, pivotal in improving the outcomes of M6, and also, at the same time, ensuring good quality outcomes and reduced carbon. In Australia and New Zealand, there's a move to stop using post-operative uh, antibiotic drops, which are all in plastic bottles, because after the use of intracameral antibiotics, endophthalmitis is reasonably well controlled. So that's all, it's all very good. And I'll leave you with intravitreal injections again, which are, have now overtaken uh, cataract surgery as an important, not only procedure, but also an <laughs> important em emitter of carbon. So uh, look at what you do and see how you can reduce uh, the carbon footprint of a simple thing like an intravitreal injection. We operate in theaters, and if you look at this photograph of the theater, you'll see so many things in blue which are all disposable. We should look at the lighting we use. We should look at the, uh, you know, whether what we leave on at night, the air conditioning, and so on. So there are so many things that we can look at in trying to reduce this carbon footprint. So to summarize, it's always about reduce, reuse, recycle. But to that, I would add rethink and research, because that's the key to going ahead. As ophthalmologists, we also have administrative functions, we have business functions, we run departments, we run hospitals, we run hospital chains, and we are also running businesses. So there's no point in running a business which is not sustainable, otherwise you'll never be able to deliver IK in the way you want to deliver IK. And I think as, 
as an ophthalmologist, as a doctor, you need to be a good manager, understand finance, understand cash flow, understand all these things if you want to run a sustainable practice. For those of you who run uh, eye care systems, uh, I think an article by David Green has been very, very, uh, I find it very good, where it looks at economies of scale and all that kind of stuff, which will help you keep sustainability at the forefront of what you do. In this context, I think India and Nepal uh, lead the way. The Arvind Ai system, the LV Prasad people, the Chitrakut uh, hospitals, you know, and the hospitals in, in Nepal, which has got a very good public uh, eye care system, uh, you know, are global models that can teach even the developed countries, when I say in inverted commas, uh, a lot in terms of sustainability. So what about charitable sustainability? Now, Mohammed Yunus, you all know, the guy who talked about microfinance from Bangladesh, he talks about the charity dollar. Now, we often say, well, I've given to charity, you know, leave me alone, let me be. But the charity dollar is a one-off thing. You give $10 or 10 rupees or $1,000 or 1,000 rupees, and it's a one-off, it's gone. But if you convert that and question how your dollar is being used or your rupee is being used and say, I want to convert this into a charity business dollar so that ultimately your charity dollar or your charity rupee will go a much longer way, which will add on to sustainability even in the charity sector. Other aspects of sustainability include gender balance. Now, the UN report from 2020, the women report, shows that males are still uh, dominating whether they're parliamentary positions, whether they're managerial positions, and this is not sustainable because men are not the commonest gender in the world, you know. We've got women also to consider. And I think a target of 50% ultimately, but really uh, for us we set it at 35% in Australia, we've reached that and we aspire to go up to 50%. Remember, diversity and inclusion are other causes of imbalance which need to be addressed. A workforce needs to be addressed. Uh, we need to make sure that we can keep our workforce going so that what we do remains sustainable. During COVID, we've learned a lot of lessons, including working from a distance, working from home, the use of telehealth, and also I think artificial intelligence is going to have a lot of role to play as we move on to the future. It's all very good to talk about this, but nothing is going to happen without political involvement. Nothing is going to happen without political will, and nothing is going to happen without political sign-off. And I think the, the recent elections in Australia have shown this. The previous government, which governed for 10 years, was kicked out because they did not have a good climate change, a policy that addresses climate change. Telehealth is again something to consider as we move on the future. Remember, in your pocket, in your purse, in your bag, you, you have a, a computer that you're carrying all the time, which will be useful, as will be home monitoring devices as we go along. So what have we done as a college? What have we done as a profession in Australia? First of all, we did a survey and found that most of our people were very savvy and wanted something done about climate change. In fact, women and younger ophthalmologists were very keen on this. People who were living in remote and rural areas were not very keen on this. Now, we'll have to find out why. And also, they believe that medical organizations like ours have a great role to play, and that we should hold public hospitals accountable and put sustainability as a key performance indicator. So while the United Nations has got 17 sustainable development goals, we, as a profession, have adopted and embraced eight of them which are relevant to us. We've launched Vision 2030 and Beyond, which is really a, a vision for the future involving the whole workforce, uh, where we're looking at six pillars of, uh, you know, that support Vision 2030, and one of the most important pillars is sustainability. We are involved with advocacy uh, at uh, both local and, and uh, national and international level, we have a magazine called Eye to Eye where we put articles on sustainability on all the time and absolutely no hesitation in highlighting good examples such as the Arvind Eye Care System, which all comes from India. We have uh, clinical guidelines on uh, reduction of uh, waste in cataract surgery, which I just signed off this morning, so it should be available on our website. So 
sustainability is supported by Women in Ophthalmology Committee, a diversity and inclusion committee, which really goes on how the whole organization of RANSCO is governed. So future pathways for us will con con continue to, to advocate. We would uh, look at uh, deepening our engagement and would also always be looking at innovations. As individuals, you can do a lot. See what you do in your life, see what you do with your family every day and see what you can do. As a profession, it's not only ophthalmology. We need all doctors to act because I think if you want to move ahead, we need to shape the future, not let the future shape us. So the time to act is now. So I challenge you, get on with it.